Thank you all so much for being here. As you know, this is part of our CCWT webinar series. And today we are excited to have Dr. Taewon Kim, who is going to be facilitating today's webinar. Dr. Taewon Kim is an award-winning assistant professor of counseling psychology at the University of Florida. Her main research is focus is economic marginalization, which encompasses constructs such as suboptimal work, poverty, social class, social class capital, social mobility, and classism. Her research strands include investigating how structural and in intersectional forces, um, such as economic, racial, and linguistic marginalization, unfairly distribute social class capital and other resources to access to work opportunities. She also focuses her research on advancing the literature on the conceptualization and the measurement of subject, subjective social mobility and social class, and on examining how economic marginalization and suboptimal work relate to mental health and well being. As I mentioned, Dr. Kim is an award winning um, uh, scholar. Her, she's already at an early career stage, won a number of national awards. And we were so delighted to have her participate in our Early Career Scholars Program for CCWT. And I'm thrilled that she's um, willing to share her wisdom with us all this morning. So thank you so much, Taiwan, and welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Taiwan, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida. And of course, my major is counseling psychology program. Um, I wish I could see everyone's face, so I feel a little weird right now because I cannot see everyone, but hopefully this will be still very interactive uh, together. And as we shared this before, I have a couple of slides that have Slidos program. So there are some numbers. Oh, I think, okay, not number, but there is a link in our chat box saying that you may want to sign in the Slido and at the same time in my slide there are some QR codes that you can take a picture and that would lead to certain links to participate um, in my presentation. So that could be something that we are going to do together and today the title of this um, presentation is Racialized and Multidimensional Poverty Among College Students and my gender pronouns is she her as well. Okay, so let's get started. Um, okay. Okay, introduction. So before I start sharing my stuff, I think I need to introduce myself to you. So I decided to make this slide. So basically, I'm very interested in economy marginalized population. And to support this group, I have three general agenda items in terms of my research programs. The first one is poverty that is consistent with um, the presentation that I'm gonna talk about. Um, the second thing is social class or social mobility. So the thing is having a lot of money or not having some money is just that thing. What I meant is that also has some cultural background within that. So for example, certain cultural background also shapes our identities and it also gives some sub signals. Like for example, if we wear some brands of clothes, then we might notice that, oh, that people are coming from high social class background. So that is some stuff that I'm also interested in right now. And the third stuff that I'm interested in is bad jobs. I mean, there are so many bad jobs in this world, including underemployment or precarious work, temporary work or job instability or something like that. So these are my main research focuses that I have. And for that, my ultimate goal is to provide really great vocational and clinical care as a researcher. So this is my main research area. And at the same time, I also have kind of like side job that is focused on linguistic marginalization. And I also develop some clinical theories or models for international therapy or international clinicians supervisions as well. So this is brief overview about who I am. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I hope I could see your faces again, okay, but I just wanted to ask you a question about this number. What can you think of what is this number? 11.5% with 
37.9 million. I guess it's a lot of number. I mean, I cannot hear your answer, but this number is about people who experienced poverty in the United States in 2022, which is a lot for sure. The next question that I have here is around 16% to 40%. What is this number about? This number is about some college students who experience poverty. So as you can see, there are a lot of people out there who experience poverty. And I have a question for you that we are gonna use Slido here. Okay, so when you work with your students, what types of poverty experiences did, did you notice? You can use the QR code to answer this question. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Food insecurity. Yes. Rent is really high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I currently live in Gainesville right now, and the rent is crazy, even though this is a college town. Mm -hmm. Yes. No money for books. Yes. Multiple part-time jobs. Yeah, which we are going to talk about for sure. Mm -hmm. Taking care of family members because they have some financial pressure to contribute to family income. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, unpaid internships. Yes. Yes, classism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have really great ideas because all of this will be something that I'm going to talk about for this presentation. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have to pause their education because the tuition is too expensive. Right, multiple jobs to support themselves and family members, right? Okay, I think these are all great ideas. So the basic themes that I can notice from this chat box is first, the basic needs. Their basic needs have not been met for sure. And the second thing is their pressure to contribute to family income because their family members are also struggling financially as well. Mm. We have one more participant typing. So let me wait. Mm. Yes, yes, financial aid is something that I'm going to talk about as well. Yes. So I really appreciate your insight because your lived experiences working with the internet, um, with the, um, the students really guided the research programs that I'm gonna do right now. So I really appreciate um, these opinions. And let's really talk about some multi-dimensional poverty. Okay, so to measure the experiences of poverty, um, previous researchers used objective indicator, which is money. So for example, some researchers use the federal poverty line, like for example, for certain numbers of people as a household income, this is the amount of money that could be regarded as poverty line or something like that, which is a great indicator. And at the same time, it has some caveats around that. Because for example, um, let's say that I, earn around $2,000 in a month in medicine. Do you think it's pretty enough to live in Madison, city of Madison? Maybe or maybe not. I mean, depending on the apartment that I'm going to live because the rent is always different based on what types of apartments that I'm going to live. And at the same time, do you think, do you think earning $2,000 in a month living in New York City is enough? Probably not, because first, the rent is crazily high there, and also the living cost is super expensive, and there are cultural norms living there. I mean, they are full of professionals in New York City, so I might experience some pressure or cultural norms to buy certain clothes, certain designer bags to follow their culture to feel fitting in. So like this. The objective indicator is good to measure certain levels of poverty. And at the same time, it has some caveats around measuring some subjective experiences as well. 
So to overcome these issues, some researchers started to use subjective indicators. And these indicators are something that you brought up in our discussion before, which is basic needs. So we started to measure whether students or people have enough money to afford some food or houses or apartments. So food insecurity and housing insecurity are something that researchers try to measure to find some subjective experiences of poverty. And then they started to measure a continuum of poverty from mild poverty, including having struggles in paying some rent or having some struggles by some food to the extreme level of poverty, including experiences of eviction or they are so starving because they cannot buy any food for sure. So we started to measure the continuum poverty, which is great. And at the same time, there are some contemporary feminists in the women's study area started to argue that this is not enough. And what they bring up to measure the multidimensional poverty is relational poverty. And this is something that you also brought up in the discussion section before. So the basic theory behind that is relationship can prevent us from experiencing poverty or it can also reproduce the level of poverty. And feminists brought up two constructs around relational poverty. The first one is financial responsibilities that you brought up before. So some people have some pressure to contribute to their family income. They feel obligated to financially support their family members because including themselves and also their family members are struggling to meet their basic needs. So think about this. Um, let's say that you are working with your student and let's say that that student is only struggling for food insecurity. That's already hard enough. And at the same time, let's say that there is another student who experiences both financial insecurity, like food insecurity. And at the same time, the student has some pressure to contribute to their family in terms of their money or financial things. That will be extra layer of financial burden, of course. So this is one construct. And the second construct that the feminist scholars argued is financial dependence. It means that some people or some students have to depend on other people to meet their basic needs. I mean, superficial level, it sounds better because it means that they have some social network or social capital or social support who are willing to provide some financial support to them, which is good. And at the same time, quite a lot of research shows that students or people who receive financial support from other people have a lot of pressure to pay back later on. So they are quite struggling with the financial stress for sure. And at the same time, think about the reasons of why they had to receive some money from other people instead of applying for, for example, federal support. Because some of them are not eligible to apply for federal aid because of, for example, nationality or ineligibility, for example, because of their undocumented status. So think about this thing because we are gonna keep talking about this part later on. Okay. The next thing that I want to talk about is racialized poverty. In this slide, I think I need to provide some definition around being racialized first. So scholars kind of define their racialized as the process of excluding people of color or othering people of color in the historical domains, political domains, institutional domains, and economic domains that might determine access to resources, opportunities, power, and privilege. So that is called as racialized. And with this definition, I want to propose this one racialized poverty. So I want to operationalize racialized poverty as disproportionate poverty prevalence and structures that intersect with a lot of structural factors related to race and racial identities. In fact, 
So many studies already reveal that students of color or people of color are struggling more with poverty experiences. So that's kind of norm that we have. So for example, let's look at this table or figure. For 30 years, the wealth gap between white people and people of color has been always the same. It has never been narrowed down for 30 years. And interestingly, I mean, not interestingly, it's more of sadly, after the COVID-19 pandemic, the gap, the wealth gap between racial minorities and white people is getting wider. But the thing is, a lot of studies have not identified how the poverty patterns could be different based on race. And this is, I feel like it's a little problem because we know that people of color are more likely to experience poverty. And at the same time, if we never know the structures or patterns or natures of poverty, then how can we support them better? So this is my research question that I have. And at the same time, I want to acknowledge that each racial group has different dynamics in terms of systemic oppression, cultural oppression, or institu institutional oppression that might impose some economy marginalization. So I want to acknowledge that part. And at the same time, there has been some collective systemic oppression that have been collectively out there to reproduce economy disparities across racial um, minorities, which I want to say is white supremacy. So with that thought, I have a different question for you all. Okay, so what systemic factors or barriers can you think that might lead to racialized poverty based on the conversation that we have together? So please use the QR code or please check the number to use the slido.com and please share some of your thoughts around this. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Biases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, housing insecurity. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to talk about this later, but historically in the United States, there have been a lot of discriminatory real estate practice for sure, including red lines and discriminatory housing problems or something. Yes. No access to assistance. Yes. I mean, for example, I was an international student, like doctor program, in a doctor program. And because I was an international student, I was not allowed to work over 20 hours. So how I cope with my poverty experiences was just to go to the food bank. And I also had to borrow some money from other people. Or sometimes I just to, had to work illegally and then receive some money under the table because some other peers in my cohort or above or below my cohort, they were able to work as a therapist so that they kind of started as their part-time job as a therapist, but I was not allowed to work as a therapist because the only working hours that I had to do was 20 hours a week. Mm, generational poverty for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, geography. Yeah, because of the color lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, imbalanced job prospects. Mm -hmm. You brought up really great points because everything will be something that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Okay, so let me move on. All right. So I need to confess that I'm still new to the United States. I'm still learning the United States history and all the cultural background because I came to the United States around six years ago. So please be mindful about um, my background here, but still I want to share some stuff that I have learned so far in terms of the discriminatory historical background that United States have. So let's talk about some institutionalized systemic oppression first. Some of you already talked about the geographical information or the real estate thing. You know that there have been some red lines in the United States and the real estate practice have been really discriminatory um, toward people of color for sure. And work specifically, some of you already noted this part, the income inequity based on race. And at the same time, there have been a lot of 
racism, xenophobia, or linguistic marginalization in the hiring process or promotion process. So some of you already know this experiment a lot. So there are two same resumes with all the same qualifications and all the same educational background. And one resume has just a typical white person's name there, like for example, Emma Johnson, versus the second resume has a foreign name, let's say Taiwan Kim. Even though the qualifications, educational background, and job skills, job experiences, everything is the same, still the resume with the white names thing was more likely to receive the job offers compared to the resume with the foreign name. And this study has been replicated like multiple times, like thousands of times, and the finding was always the same. So like this, there has been a lot of discrimination based on racial identities, um, based on racism, xenophobia, all the things um, that causes some problems for sure. And at the same time, you might know that so, um, people of color were not able to join the union back in like 30 years ago or 40 years ago for sure. And this kind of systemic oppression has been also applicable to the college context as well. For example, I think I already told you this, there are some students of color who are not eligible to apply for better resources, including myself. So for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I was not able to receive any, what is that called? The check like to support um, our life during the pandemic 19, and the COVID-19, because I was foreigner. I was regarded as a foreigner at the time. I mean, still I'm regarded as foreigner legally. And there are some students who are afraid of being deported. So that's why they cannot apply for any federal resources or even community resources because they have to note down their um, legal status on the paperwork. Um, the other stuff is something that I told you before, the international students are not eligible to work more than 20 hours a week. So they have to go to food bank, they need to borrow some money from other people, and sometimes it's pretty common for international students to legally work outside of academia to support their basic needs. So this could be some institutional, institutional pressure. And also let me explain some psychological stuff going on there. Okay, stigma. So a lot of research, research shows that students of color are struggling with their internalized stigma when seeking some support. Um, for example, asking for some support from faculty members, peers, or going to certain centers because they know that there are some stigma around them attributing their poverty experiences to their, for example, lack of confidence, competence, work ethics, or something like that, probably coming from classism or nativism or something like that. So that kind of limits them from asking for support. Another culture stuff that I also want to note is some students of color culturally have some cultural norm to financially contribute to their family members' incomes, for example, because of reality piety or reciprocal culture. So these could be some stuff that we want to know beforehand. Okay. The next thing that I want to talk about is paid internship and first-generation college student status. So far, we have been talking about the natures of poverty experiences that college students might experience. And this time, I want to talk about what factors could contribute to poverty experiences. And a couple of theory, uh, including the latent deprivation theory and also psychology of working theory, suggest that first-gen college student status and internship might be the predictors of poverty experiences that college students might have. So let's talk about the internship thing first. So some studies reveal that students who have full-time jobs are less likely to experience poverty, which makes a lot of sense. And of course, because they are also full-time students, one example of full-time jobs that they might have is, of course, internship. 
So that might be pretty helpful for them because anyway, participating in internship might give them some stable income. And at the same time, even if that internship is the paid internship opportunity, there are some caveats around that. The first one is, of course, that is temporary job. Having, for example, three months contract, six months contract, or a year, a year contract, which means that it doesn't guarantee any stable income later on. The second thing is the legal practice. What I meant by that is I found if the, if the employers regarded their interns as trainees and noted that language on the document or legal stuff, then they don't need to provide the minimum wage. So that's how they play things around under the table to avoid some financial stuff from there on. So with this information, some students, even if they have some full-time um, internship, like paid internship opportunities, they might be financially struggling. So that is one thing that you may want to think about. And the next thing is first-gen college student status. And of course, there is a lot of research talking about how first-gen college students experience levels of poverty. And of course, the thing is, First-generation college students who identify themselves as a student of color are also likely to experience a lot of poverty experiences. So we know this information. However, what we don't know about this phenomena is how their poverty structures could look like, what their natures of poverty experiences could look like. So that is something that I want to share with you all. Okay, so... My basic question here is, how do we know about multidimensional poverty experiences that college students might have? And of course, I have secondary data from CCWT, so I was not able to include any systemic oppression variables, including racism or something like that. But at least I wanted to see how the poverty structures or the qualities or natures could be different based on our racial identities. And the next thing around my research team is, I wondered whether paid internship is helpful to solve the poverty experiences. The last thing that I was curious about here was any intersectionality regarding first-gen college student status. So I used some variables to navigate what was going on and I conducted a multi-group latent classes analysis. I mean, this is not the stack courses, so I'm not talking about the detailed information about how I ran the data things or what the sp uh, specific numbers were there, but basically the latent cluster or the latent class analysis is the person-centered approach, which means that it kind of collects some people based on the general themes. So we are able to see certain groups of people based on these variables. And this is the secondary data. So there were some variables out there in the data set. And what I used is like this. So the left part is basic needs or basic net insecurity, whether did they, did they have to receive some food support or did they experience some difficulties paying rent or did they ever experience eviction? or did they struggle paying the bill? So these are the basic needs stuff. And I also included two indicators that measure relational poverty. The one is, did they have to borrow some money to meet their basic needs? And the second thing is, did they have to financially contribute to their family members because their family members also struggle with um, their basic needs? So these are the two basic structures that I wanted to measure in this data set. Um, and all these variables were measured like in the past 30 days, did you have to borrow some money? Or in the past 30 days, did you experience eviction or something like that? So there were some limited time period to measure these experiences. And the participants were around 4,000 people. 
So in the next slide, I'm going to share the general patterns of poverty structures that university students have. And I have to note that this data was pulled by nine colleges in the United States. Okay, let me use the highlighter. Um, okay, so we have four different groups from the general data set that consists of around 4,000 college students. And the blue bar is whether they had to receive some food support. And the red bar is whether they had some difficulties paying some rent. The green part is eviction. The purple bar is whether they struggle with paying some bills like water, electricity, or internet. The light blue is whether they had to borrow some money to meet their basic needs. And the orange bar is whether they had to um, financially support their family members because they were also financially struggling. With this information, let's see the first group here. Um, as you can see, all the indicators were endorsed within this first group. And this first group were around 40 people out of 4,000 people. So even though it's relatively fewer, still it's significant. Um, and you can, as you can see, most of the indicators were all over 60 percentage. So for example, in this group, almost everyone, all 40 people experienced they had to borrow some money from other people. And around 93% of this group had some struggles paying for a bill, and around 95% of this group were struggling to pay the rent. And the key part of this group was around 30% of this group experienced eviction, which is a lot. Because as you just imagine, eviction is just the most extreme indicator in terms of housing insecurity for sure. So around 40 people out of 4,000 students experienced multifaceted and extreme level of poverty. Let's look at the second group. Um, as you can see, most of the indicators were endorsed around 30% to 60%. The only difference, not only, but one of the difference between the extreme level and moderate level is eviction part. So this group, rarely experienced any eviction. And at the same time, their level of poverty experiences were a little moderate compared to this extreme level. The third group is contribution to family members. You can see small bars here and there, but these were not statistically meaningful. The only orange part was significant in this group, which was about their pressure to financially support their family members. And around 80% of this group had to experience this thing. The last group is economically secured group. You can see two little bars over there, but they are not statistically significant. So around 60% of college students are pretty secured in terms of um, economic um, or financial struggles, which is good. So it's pretty consistent with our general bias, like, yeah, college students are pretty um, prestigious and also privileged group, yes? And at the same time, 40% of college students are economically, financially struggling. So this could be something that you want to know. And the next step that I did for here is to see if there are some racial differences in these poverty structures. So I had to do some statistical magic to see if there are some group differences. And yes, there were some group differences. So I had to test how the structures of poverty are different based on race. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the students of color's poverty experiences first. Um, okay, there we go. Seems like it's pretty similar with the general population's poverty experiences. 
And at the same time, there are some differences as well. So let me explain that part. The first group, around 2% of this group experienced extreme level multifaceted poverty. Most of the indicators were endorsed over 80%. And also around 30% of this group experienced eviction, which is a little more than the general population. The second group is also same, like moderate poverty, but no eviction experiences. I think the third group is pretty interesting. I mean, I don't wanna say interesting, it's more of unique per se compared to the general group, because do you remember the third group of the general sample? So from them, the third group was more of they had to financially support their family members. However, for students of color, what they experienced was more of the broad relational poverty. So let's look at this. The light blue bar means they had to borrow some money. And at the same time, they had to receive some financial support from other people. What that means by that is, of course, they have some cultural norms to financially support their family members. And at the same time, to cope with their basic needs, they also had to borrow some money from other people. What that means by that, I mean, of course, this data set didn't have enough information of why they borrowed some money or how they borrowed some money. But just imagine this part, a lot of students of color are not eligible to apply for federal grant or federal um, aid. And at the same time, they are also struggling with some internalized stigma in terms of help seeking behavior. So that might be the reason why. Of course, we are gonna talk about this later. And around 75% of this group were economically okay. So this is students of color's group thing. And the next slide, not next slide, but next part is about why students' poverty experiences. Okay, so in this group, three portfolios emerged. One of the surprising thing is in this group, they don't have any membership who shows multifaceted and extreme level of poverty. This group only had moderate level of poverty. So look at this bars. Some of the indicators are from 40% to 80% of level of poverty. And at the same time, compared to students of a color group, they never experienced, not never per se, but they rarely experienced any eviction experiences. So from this result, we can kind of conclude that students of color are more likely to experience eviction. So that is the first thing. The second group here is some of them experienced multifaceted, but very mild poverty experiences. Their indicators are around 30%. The last group is economically secured group, which consists of around 86% of this sample, which means that white students are more likely to be economically privileged. So this is another stuff that I want you to share. And the next slide, I'm going to talk about how first in students status and also internship kind of predict these different structures. OK. First thing that was super surprising to me was internship didn't predict anything around these two different poverty structures based on race. So it seems like internship is not helpful to resolve any poverty structures. It might be because people who are able to apply for paid internship already have a lot of resources, so maybe that's why. Or at the same time, even if that was the paid internship opportunities, maybe the pay was not enough, so that was why their poverty structures were the same, even if they were able to receive some financial support through internship opportunity. So this could be something that we want to talk about later. And the second thing is about first generation college student status. The first finding around this is white first generation college students 
are more likely to below the moderate level of poverty structure that you saw that you saw before. The second finding is a little sad. First generation students of color are more likely to experience extreme level of poverty. So think about the intersectionality perspective. Seems like if your student is student of color, and at the same time, if they are first-gen students, then they are likely to experience extreme level of poverty. So this is the main finding that I have from CCWT data set. And I'm going to share some main takeaways from this webinar. First, we know that we have some biases around culture, um, college students. Yeah, they are very privileged. They are prestigious because they were able to afford that huge high tuition, which is the case. And at the same time, around 40% of students experience multidimensional poverty. And around 2%, 2% of this population experience extreme level of poverty, even including eviction. The second point that you may want to think about is students of color are more likely to experience extreme level of poverty. And their nature of poverty is quite different from white students' poverty because they have some pressure to financially support their family members. And at the same time, they also have to receive some money from other people, not through some institutionalized support. And we may want to think of those reasons. The third one is eviction. So eviction is a key indicator to identify if our students experience extreme level of poverty. And at the same time, students of color are more likely to experience eviction. The fourth one is you may want to consider relational poverty. So when you work with your students, when you do the intake session, or when you want to make some case conceptualization, you may want to get some information about their relational poverty, like how much pressure they have to financially contribute to their family members. Are their family members also struggling for financial stuff? Or do they have to receive some money from other people because they're not eligible to apply for some institutional support? So that could be something that you may want to consider when you need to assess their level of poverty experiences. The fifth one is, sadly, internship was not helpful. We may want to think about that, and we may want to have some conversations around that, about why internship, even if there was paid internship, that was not helpful to solve their poverty experiences. I told you already that my assumptions around that is first, the employers were not willing to give them the minimum wage, the second thing is the contract is too temporary. The third thing is um, students who received this opportunity were already privileged enough so that this pay through the internship was just some extra layer of money of, from what they have in terms of money. The last one is intersectionality. So again, the intersection between first-gen college student status and also students of color are more likely to vulnerable to extreme level of poverty. So this is the basic findings that I have so far that I wanted to share with you. And what I have for now is I have one vignette that I just created for you all. So what I want you to do is to read this vignette and consider all the findings or conversations that we had together to find how we can support these students. So let me read this vignette. Kim, the gender pronouns is she, her, is a third year college student majoring in psychology at University of Wisconsin-Madison. She is a first generation college student who came from Japan. She shared her financial struggles to buy some materials to support her academic work, such as a laptop. She reported that she felt guilty about her family members because of their financial struggles. 
Her presented concern is that she is uncertain about her career goals. She is afraid to commit to any internship opportunities and she is financially stressed out. With this vignette, I was wondering how you want to work with this student in your position. I know that some of you might be therapists, some of you might be career counselors, some of you might be faculty members. With your position or with your role, how do you want to work with this, um, with this student based on the findings or the discussion that we had so far? Um, I'm not sure whether we can directly talk about this, but maybe we can use the chat box. Hi, Taiwan. Um, yes. It's Missy. I can actually, if you like, I can mm -hmm. allow everyone to unmute if you'd like yes. to have more of a discussion. Yeah, that would be perfect. Thank you so much. Let me just... Okay. So now, um, if anybody would like to discuss this, you are able to unmute yourself. So feel free to go ahead and do that if you'd like to discuss. Or you can put something in the chat if that's how you prefer to participate. I hope I can see people's face, but please don't be shy. <laughs> I'm not a bad person. <laughs> or maybe we can also talk about, oh, I think someone said something. Sorry, yes, hi. Thank you so much for your presentation so far. This is fantastic. I'll say that one thing that I've been reading about um, revisiting Hermini Ibarra's work on mm -hmm. career development is um, that uh, careers tend to unfold with a test and learn model rather than a plan and implement. So the hesitation about taking an internship opportunity, mm -hmm. I, I like to uh, reemphasize those kind of things that it's important to sample opportunities. So um, mm -hmm. that's part of what I would say. And then also mm -hmm. related to that, and this is, uh, maybe going more towards my angle on things is focusing on specific skills to focus on for an internship. So even though your internship opportunity may not be perfect, there's still things you can gain from them. Um, mm -hmm. And that can help to frame that even if the internship you have, you're constrained into taking because of financial circumstances, you can mm -hmm. still try to aim for some outcomes that are positive for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Providing a lot of encouragement to help her test the water, mm -hmm. to gain some skills, knowledge on top of some financial support. Mm -hmm. Seems like someone put something in the chat box. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Uh, yeah, I can read that right. if you'd like. So mm -hmm. Holly, Holly Logan says, ask her if she feels comfortable sharing more. Has she sought out part-time on-campus jobs with the support of faculty or staff, might feel safer, can still build skills, also make money over a few semesters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think this is really great point because how can I say, even based on my lived experiences, um, working outside of campus felt a little unsafe per se, given the potential discrimination that it might have. So I kind of felt that working on campus is more how can I say, safer per se to international students because we pretty feel safer on campus because we know that um, faculty members, staff members, and students are more likely to support international students, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it seems like you wanted to talk about the sense of safety as an international student. Other things? that you want to identify from this vignette? Taewon, it's Missy again. I <laughs> kind of got stuck on the part where she was uncertain about her career goals. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess maybe I was thinking just helping her explore that a little bit more mm -hmm. might mm -hmm. help um, right. of this. Um, mm -hmm. So if she's unsure about that, um, that might be part of why she's uncertain about the internship as well. Like, how do you do an internship if you're not even sure if this is the field you want to be in? Um, so going back to what the first commenter said, I think that was mm -hmm. Michael, um, you know, maybe, maybe digging a little deeper into that and then talking mm -hmm. about, you know, 
why don't we think about maybe what maybe there's something else you'd like to explore and maybe we'll we look at an internship in that field um mm-hmm. and, and do that instead um mm-hmm. I was just thinking along those lines and also just connecting connecting Kim to um counseling services or something to help with mm-hmm. mental health. right right thank you for the great point because that is one of the parts that I intentionally made vague <laughs> so that we can just think about stuff more because I thought that maybe Kim might be struggling to apply for internship because she might already have a lot of um part-time jobs so that she cannot think of any other time that she can make some commitment or she is so financially constrained so that she even cannot think broader in terms of applying for internship or she might feel a little unwelcome or in uninvited per se in working in the United States, or she might have some uncertainty around some cultural capital that she may need to accrue in terms of working in the United States. So I just wanted to make that part a little big so that we can just brainstorm some barrier that she could have. Mm. Seems like, yes, yes. Several people shared, mm, yes, emergency funds. Yes, scholarship. Right, 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 right. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I really appreciate the emergency fund because as a doctor student in the past, I also struggled financially a lot. So I had to apply for multiple scholarship and some of them were only eligible to citizenship people. So I had to find a lot of other scholarships that are also applicable to international students. And it seems like someone unmuted to say something. Maybe I was misunderstanding. Okay, then let me read the next thing. Yes. Right, right, good environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Oh, alumni, right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Does you, does Wisconsin Medicine have some like formal alumni, like career center or organization to connect people to alumni? Like, do they have some structures around that? Hi, it's Holly. I can say more about that. Um, I don't know specifically about the University of Wisconsin Madison, but generally, like, I, so I work in a career center at a university, and we encourage students to use LinkedIn and mm-hmm. find alumni of our university in fields of interest in general, or just to have a contact, like you know, somebody maybe recently graduated, so they're more knowledgeable at the about mm-hmm. the um, possibilities of what's out there, and so just making those really. Um, uh, I don't want to say superficial, but those like initial outreach, mm-hmm. those having those conversations can help students like see themselves possibly in the future in a field. Mm-hmm. So that might help Kim mm-hmm. if she can use LinkedIn, for example, to make those kind of connections. And then yeah, UW Madison might have their own alumni pro- program. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You brought a really great point because when I work as a clinician, um, how could you say? The idea that helped me a lot to support um, college students was I need to connect them to other resources because there are so many resources out there or there are so many people out there who want to support people, but we just don't know how to connect them. So thinking of the broadened concept, the broad concept of well-being is so important. Mm. Mm. Right, not taking an internship. Mm. Could you explain more about why you kind of think that not taking an internship might be also helpful? It was it Michael? Ah, oh no, <laughs> sorry. But that kind of makes sense as well because our finding kind of suggests that Receiving some paid internship was not helpful to resolve the the issues around poverty. So there might be some good or better ways to support this student as well. Okay, I'm aware of time. We have only three minutes, but 
Any questions so far? <laughs> I just wanted to jump in and say thank you so much. I appreciated everyone's comments in the chat and those of you who spoke aloud as well. And I think this really speaks to sort of the beauty of the CCWT community that we can take a question or a problem that is posed for some of our students and think together um, from a really broad perspective of how each of us in our different roles might um, you know, interact and support this particular student that that Dr. Kim mentioned and sort of uh, gave us a brief vignette about. You know, one of the things I was thinking as well was about this question of um, internships and what additional concerns um, may have been sparked by the possibility of an internship, including things like, you know, not having the laptop, but also things like um, if feeling uncomfortable perhaps with their uh, clothing or the types of bag that they carry, that. If, depending on the internship setting that they may feel like they wouldn't fit in um, or experience a greater classism in that setting. So that was another kind of set of um, factors I was considering and thinking about the case vignette. So thank you so much for sharing that and, and for allowing us all to contribute and have some discussion around that. Thank you so um, much for coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm aware of time and I just want to, um, I know some folks are still putting things in the chat, which is fantastic. Missy shared a link. Um, we do invite you all to give feedback on our webinar series. This um, helps us all as presenters to get feedback and it really helps us as CCWT to learn from all of you to think about what future programming you might be interested in. So please don't hesitate to be in contact. Um, you can check us out on the website and see other upcoming webinars, or um, if you wanna learn about our recently launched affiliate group, there's information about that as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Kim, for presenting to us today and sharing your research and sharing some of your wisdom that you've gleaned from uh, analyzing our data. So thank you. Thank you, I felt so honored. Thank you so much. And please email me if you have any questions. Thank you so much.